we're building this channel. We're, we're getting our Market Pulse members uh, built up right now. And uh, I've got quite an exciting uh, day for you today. So let me just give you kind of like the, like what in totality we're going to go over during this hour. So this is an hour long webinar. You're welcome to come and go as you please. Uh, we actually post this live in my podcast. And I also, if you register for my um, sub stack, you can get this in written version emailed to you every week. And that's absolutely free. So uh, you can go to any of my channels to get in my link trees. Any of my socials have my link tree that you can get the Substack link um, and you can enjoy that. Or you could also go to my LinkedIn profile and I post those articles there weekly as well. But here's where we're going over today. So we're going to do a gold analysis because as you guys know, I'm, I'm quite bullish on gold right now. We're also going to do um, an S&P 500 review from the previous week. So we did both of those reviews and Guys, we were spot on in terms of our technical analysis and where the price went. I'm not Houdini, but as you follow me and you, you learn how to do these technical analysis uh, analyses, you'll learn to start impressing your friends on a level you've never done before. We're going to talk also, I always take a little segment and talk about the psychology of money or the psychology of trading in this case. And I'm going to expose... You guys are going to be the first to kind of see this section that's coming out in my book in April about these four quadrants that we uh, developed over the last three years that helps people get into authorship of their life. And if it has to do with money, your trading account, your investments, you want to be an author in that, meaning you want to be someone who actually moves towards the things you want as if you were writing it in a book. And that's what authorship looks like. And we'll talk about the other quadrants and where we get stuck and really how we're blinded by our strengths in this uh, area. And in the news, you guys have probably already seen this. We might touch on this a little bit, uh, but we're going to talk a little bit probably about the attack on Israel, the war in Hamas, the conflict in the Middle East, so to speak, and my personal thoughts on where I think that's going. We're going to talk about the U.S. economy. Uh, talking about U.S. interest rate hikes, there's a chart that is just insane, and it's uh, showing data that we haven't seen, guys. We haven't seen this kind of spike in over 30 years. We're also going to talk about what certain sectors believe about next year having a recession. And it's quite revealing as you look at this data, whether it's business owners, CEOs, Main Street, or certain indexes or the Feds what the likelihood they think of a recession is. And the data really shows kind of who's leading. And I'll give my insight and my, my opinions on like uh, why I think it's going to be going in a certain direction. Uh, a lot of news around Bitcoin this week. I'm going to go through that. Jobless claims is how we'll end. And then we'll go uh, and set up those trades. So let's start. One of my favorite things to do is to start with our trade review. So I'm going to bring my charts up for my listeners. This is going to be a little more difficult, but I'll do my best to describe what's going on here. We're going to go through, and I want to bring up, there's Bitcoin. Let's bring up our uh, gold trade from last week. So we're just going to do a quick review, and then we're going to look at the S&P 500 at the end. But gold, you can see, guys, this was our analysis last week. So we drew this all up. Here was our five-day. Let me bring this back, actually. So last Friday... Today's the 27th, was the 20th. So we actually want to put a line in on the 20th. So this is what we were looking at last week, this line right here. And you can see that on the 20th, the price was floating right at about 1983. And we had this upward pressure, or you could call it an upward channel that was going up uh, into the bullish direction on gold prices. And so what we did is we saw some of these support and resistance levels, obviously coming up to the $2,000 price. It's going to be a natural resistance level because as you go back, it always struggles to break above 2000. Uh, my personal belief is once it's done that, it may never come back. But right now, it's still fighting that level. We have the pressure going up and we kind of drew this angle where we said, look, Next week, the price is going to be between these two levels. And Monday came in a little uh, bearish, 
And we kind of saw this like ticking down. But then as you saw the week go through, it really wanted one to stay inside of our channel that we drew. And it also wanted to stay kind of within this range. Um, but like we talked about, if it had broken to the short side, you could have grabbed this little tail. Um, and this would have been Tuesday. We had some short movement on gold. But for the most part, sideways momentum sideways but this has changed things even though the price is relatively close to the exact same price last friday like you can see here is the price and about 19 let me get exactly the price the high of friday was like night or where it closed was 1980 we're at 1983 at troy ounce so when you look at this we're basically the same price we were last friday however because of the pressure of this channel, it radically changes the likelihood of a future event. And so we're going to go in and make some edits on this. And you guys can follow along, make your own edits on how to trade this. And we're going to just kind of add, we're going to edit some of this, but let's clean this up. So we're going to grab this from here, take the top side. Just give me a sec here, guys. We might have to, sometimes it's easier to, delete these and just redo them. I'm going to redraw this channel. And by the way, this is quite a steep channel. And we talked about uh, last week how this, the slope of the channel actually has a lot to do with what's going to happen going forward. I'm going to delete this old one going south. We're clearly out of that channel now. Let's draw this in. So here's my bottom side. Top side should be relatively the same. And you can see we're just staying right inside of it. The difference is, however, the price currently inside of this non-linear support and resistance, we are at the bottom. So I am more bullish than I was last Friday because we not only have support of the 1973 level that we drew in, but we also have this trend support this channel that it's going in this upper direction also pushing it up so we kind of have double the support where last friday we were at the top of the channel which is why you kind of saw this drawing out into the bottom of the channel but now that we're at the bottom and we have support uh again at this 1973 level this is i'm just going to move this ellipse over here if i can and we go actually let's just draw a new one we're going to kind of put where we think the price is going to be next week i still think bullish i think it's gonna be hard for it to not go into this region but it's going to want to stay above like you just have to imagine this channel is going to keep going forward and that price is likely going to stay in that region so come monday bullish the 2000 uh Will next week be the day or be the week that we break 2000? It's going to test it. So you can count on next week testing this 2000 level. The likelihood of it not is the probability is probably less than 20%. But you've got two fighting forces. You've got the 2000 level. It's going to be pushing the price down. You have this linear support going, nonlinear support going up. It's going to be pushing the price up. And so there's going to be a battle monday or tuesday next week to see if it either breaks to the upside or it comes back down and starts playing below the 2000 level when we get into a new channel here's the play monday or tuesday you're either going to have a break above 2000 and if that happens there will be a significant move why because there's nothing above it there's no major support above it until you get to about twenty two thousand fifty dollars per ounce so Put your stops in real tight. Take your profits to about mid-size, which would be about uh, 20, 25, 26. If it goes the opposite and breaks below this 1973 level, again, keep your your stops tight. And then you could have potential room into like the 1950s. Uh, but I'm still pretty bullish on this. So I would keep your take profits tighter towards the downside, longer towards the upside uh, for the next couple of days. So obviously, this is my opinion, guys. Do your own research as we talk about. I've already agreed to those disclaimers, but uh, just a reminder. But I, I like the setup on this. All right, so moving to our next piece. Um, we will do a quick review. Let me just show you what happened on the S&P 500, and then we'll do an analysis. But guys, 
I'm not Houdini, but it's like you just couldn't call this stuff any better. So look at look at our charts. We drew this in last week. We even drew in this really steep channel. And look at how the price just really wanted to stay in this channel. And we kind of drew this bubble that said, hey, you know, above the 4,200 level on the S&P 500, we're probably going to get a bounce. Well, we had some pretty bad fundamental news last week. And so it did start to go into that region. And you can see that Monday, Tuesday, right? We were right to say it was going to be in this region. Wednesday, same thing. But then it really wanted to stay in this channel. I got some negative news come Wednesday, and it kept going down. And so this is why you got to check into day to day. But you can redo these analyses every single day, depending on how you're making your trade. And today, I just kind of give you the week overview where it's going to go. But this was brilliant. The only thing, we'll make some adjustments on this. Our channel has definitely changed, uh, the really big one that we've got there. But for the most part, um, yeah, for the most part, this is going to look pretty bearish. So we'll come back to that towards the end of our meeting. We'll do a full analysis. I'll get you guys some potential trade setups that way. But let's jump into what's next. So I like to go into the psychology piece next. And today we're going to talk a little bit about this. Um, I, I call them a four, it's like a four quadrants or uh, four archetypes. And basically what this is, is a way to navigate towards success. Now, for those of you who know, I, I use a lot of weird language and I do it intentionally because I coach a lot of prof executive professionals. You know, I do a lot of stuff on stage and in the transformation world and mostly around finance. And I find that language is what drives most things, meaning the type of language you use can either drive attention or push it away. And so I'm going to before I show you this, I'm going to talk about something that I use in language quite a bit, and that's a word called power. And power is defined a little differently for me. Power is the velocity at which you obtain the things that you desire. And in this case, I imagine you guys are joining me, right? Uh, because you want more power in your life, velocity around the things that have to do with your finance. And we're not talking power around your debt. We don't want your debt to spiral out and get a bunch of velocity, but like handling your debt or handling your finances or growing your wealth or building your wealth. Um, and all of us can have goals and eventually get somewhere, but velocity is the speed. And have you ever met someone that was like nobody, like maybe an old friend or someone you went to high school with and you're like, gosh, they just weren't, they really weren't anyone. And then in like a 12 month period or something happened and they just went from zero to hero. Now they're a celebrity. Now everyone knows who they are or they got rich somehow. And it's like, wait, what, how did this happen? Well, a lot of people think it's like this 10,000 hour rule. A lot of people think that uh, there's something about like, you got to do your time. And I'm actually going to propose that it's not that I'm going to propose that they got access to some level of velocity some level of power that they didn't previously have. And that level of power started attracting the thing that they wanted. And then out of nowhere, they just lifted off. And we've all experienced this on some level. And so I created this archetype system working with power around executives, CEOs, people who are running businesses to really identify how do we get you where you want to be? And for CEOs, you know, it's revenue based, generally speaking, or they have some goals or some products they're trying to launch for individuals or traders. Um, specifically, you know, it has to do with like increasing your wealth or having a better return or a higher percentage, right? And so we have four archetypes. We have authors who have it all. We have dreamers who have a bias, wanderers who have a bias, and then beggars who have nothing. And regardless of where we're at or what category we're talking about, you're one of these four in that category. Now, there are two things we're dealing with around getting to authorship when it comes to a goal or something that uh, we're trying to achieve. And in this case, let's pretend, you know, because we're all here around money, let's talk about it being uh, around growing our wealth, expanding our, our trading, you know, having more money. Well, there's two things that contribute to this. And one is your belief system around money. This is why there's book titles called uh, think and grow rich. This is why there's more books around the psychology of trading than there are 
uh, how to make trades is because there's something about your beliefs that actually changes how you manifest when it comes to money. And then there's this thing that, and this is my language, uh, my IP, there's this thing called interposition. And it's really about this thing internally that turns on or off around action on, on taking action towards the belief or towards something that you're going towards. So your inner position would be like one of confidence or one of guilt and shame. It'd be one of uh, pride or uh, inner knowing or, you know, fill in the blank. There's a bunch of positive inner positions, or it could be one of doubt or fear. And those will drive the action that moves forward. Now, what I've found working with executives, working with people, uh, in the trading world, thousands and thousands of people that I've either done in large rooms or one-on-one -on -one through coaching, I find you're in one of two categories. You either have really expansive beliefs, typically, like you, you're, it's like you work out this arm, but you forget to work this arm out, and like your right arm is your beliefs, your left arm is your inner position. I find typically people are strong; they have a strong suit. They're either dreamers or they're wanderers, meaning that they either have expansive beliefs or expansive interpositions. And then the other side is weak. Now, what does this look like? Well, dreamers having an expansive belief system, but limited interposition, they are the people, they are the individuals who dream a lot. They're in their head a lot. They read books. They know how to build the desk from Ikea. They went through the instruction manual four times, but they just can't get the umph. They can't get the drive to actually go build it, right? They got it half done. You know, their spouse is yelling at them because it's on their honey-do list still. They know how to do it, but they're just lacking some inner motivation to move towards it. And then we have wanderers who are kind of the opposite. They typically, you know, they buy the thing from Ikea and they don't even open the book, right? And they just start building it. They start, you know, putting the things together, trying to figure out the numbers. They're not following the instructions. Next thing you know, the ladder's on the wrong side. The doorknobs are not put in correctly and they have to like fix things. Do they get stuff done? Yeah. But do they break some windows and hit some bumps along the road? Absolutely. And then you have beggars. And I don't, I use this word, even though it's kind of in a negative context, I use this word and I'm not going to get away from it because it is illustrating something negative. I, I don't like calling people beggars. I don't like it being associated with, you know, the poor, but the, the reality is a beggar is missing both. They have neither. They have neither a positive belief system, nor do they have a strong inner position. Therefore, they get nowhere. And in fact, they are a they are a vacuum. They suck from other people and other things as well, because there's no power there. There's no way to attract the things that they want. So as you're trading, here's my tip as we kind of wrap up our psychology corner. If you're a dreamer, if you find when it comes to money, you're trading, investing, uh, expanding your existing you know, world around money, if you find that you're someone who's read all the books, if you find that you're someone who's taken a bunch of classes, paid for a bunch of lectures, done a bunch of training, but you're still lacking the actionable thing, maybe you, know, you, you lack the ability or you haven't gone out and raised the money, you haven't started building the business, you haven't started actually putting a trade plan together and testing and doing the work. You're probably a dreamer. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's lots of dreamers. Now, you're probably a wonder in the finance world if you're someone who's lost a bunch of money, borrowed a bunch of money from other people and like randomly thrown it at things, put your own money into things kind of on a, a weird tip or a news article that you saw, right? Uh, wonders are the ones that just go in heavy. They just start making trades. They start doing stuff and they start breaking windows and bouncing walls. They're the type that would say, well, you know, we learn by making mistakes. And it's like, right, that's the wonder thing to do. But when you have that moment of power where things just like spiral up and like the velocity, everything that you're doing just starts to attract it. Like you're just a magnet towards your success. You're a magnet towards your goal. That's authorship. And it really requires both. And because you really, when it comes to your own personal finances, you can't bring a business partner in. You can't go hire your wanderer if you're a dreamer, you know, et cetera. You really have to get to authorship yourself. And so how do you do this? Well, my book is going to go through that. I'm really excited about the release. But to give you some tips, I'm going to give you one tip. 
that's that's largely profound. If you are a dreamer, you will likely go get help from more dreamers. You will go get coaching from other dreamers. You will read books and go back to the way of dreaming that will keep you stuck as a dreamer rather than getting your inner position upgraded. And as a wanderer, you will do the same. If you go out to get help around this topic called money and expanding your wealth, you will typically, when you go get help, get it from other wanderers. And this is the problem with traditional therapy. This is the problem with traditional coaching. This is generally the problem with why people will come to me and say, Matt, I've gone to the experts and I'm still struggling. What's going on? It's because you are literally blinded by your strength. You're blinded by it to the degree that you go get help and you keep going, get reinforcement from your blind eye, from the, the arm that's weak. And, and the reason is, is it feels good because if you're a dreamer and you're talking to another dreamer, you're going to totally like, love it. You're both going to agree on all the same concepts. If you're a wonder and you're a wonder, it's like, oh yeah, hustle. And here we go. And it's like, guys, we're not getting it. So my advice is if you really want to get to authorship around something in your life, particularly your wealth, go start making friends, go start associating with, go get coaching from. If you're a wanderer, go pick up a book, right? If you're a dreamer, go find an actionable coach, a performance coach, someone that's going to hold you accountable to goals. But regardless, you've got to go do the thing that is, it is going to make you feel uncomfortable. Because if it makes you feel comfortable, it's likely that you're just going in and strength, you're just strengthening the muscle that you already have. Now, in business, and I'm not going to spend much more time on this, in business, there are some shortcuts. In making money, there's some shortcuts. And that is you can actually partner up, pair up with someone that has the opposite attribute. But we often don't do that either when we look for a business partner. For a dreamer, we look for a dreamer business partner. For a wanderer, we look for a wanderer business partner. It's like, ah, no wonder we get so stuck in these things. But anyways, there's my archetype system. As I shared with you guys, I like going through the psychology of, of trading because frankly, we could talk about tools, techniques. I could literally like tell you what to do and you will screw it up if your head isn't screwed on right. So having said that, we're going to move into the dreamer portion of our training, which is uh, the news. Uh, while we're doing that, I just want to give you, and I'm, first off, I want to say that I'm no expert on this. Um, I am not a geopolitical expert. I know very little about the culture of Israel and Palestine and the and the historical conflict I'm somewhat familiar with, but frankly, the people on the ground there know it better than anyone. And the history and the stories are told differently on both sides. So having said that, we are having a major conflict. And I think what everyone's watching right now is watching for signs of escalation looking for Israel to do something horrific that's going to escalate the problem, looking for other countries to start pairing up and backing people up to escalate things. And what I've seen that is actually a really positive sign that we're not going to have a lot of uh, echoes or wave patterns from this attack is I've seen multiple things happening this week that have been pointing to de-escalation. And you can look up the news yourself, but uh, what we are seeing is Israel is not overreacting. What we are seeing is very careful conversations happening. What we're seeing is countries not coming out with statements that they're backing you know, uh, certain parties. We're seeing that Iran really isn't taking a strong stance. We're seeing China not, and Russia aren't taking a, a strong stance. And the world is kind of settling this uh and israel the attack that they planned they actually didn't go out and do it on those days so we're what we are seeing is a de-escalation from the event which i think is positive news positive global economic news although there could be surprises right i'm no expert on this topic uh but we could see some issues come up around this having said that uh i think it's important to 
you know, as the global news and global effects do have impact on the U.S. economy, I think it's more important today for the sake of this training to look at uh, our news and our problems and stuff that's going on. So having said that, I want to bring up a chart that I saw this week that I think you guys will all enjoy. And this is the U.S. interest rates hike chart compared to multiple other seasons. So over the last, I think this is 35 years. So let me show you this. I'm going to bring this up on the chart. And you guys can tell me what you think on my socials in the comment section or if I missed something. So this is a this is a fascinating chart. So this is comparing the speed of U.S. interest rate hikes over the last 35 years. And you can see in yellow on the very far right, this is the last two year uh, interest rate hike. And you can see, you know, even in 15 and 18, the rate from that hike, 99 to 2000, 94 to 99, 89 to, to uh, 88 to 89. 04 to 06, you know, these were all around times where we had some inflation or some type of inflationary period and we brought interest rates up. This is the fastest we have raised interest rates than any other time in history. And it's pretty easy to understand. We also have never injected so much cash and had such a hot, an influx in M2 money supply than we did during 2001 to 2002. So we had this kind of weird period where during COVID, we stimulated the economy through all this cash in. And because of that, we got all this inflation. To combat inflation, we had to rise interest rates and we did it at a rate that's been higher and faster than the last 35 years. Now, have we done it before at higher, faster rates? Yes. We have. If you go back pre 35 years ago, there were times we jacked rates so fast you couldn't believe we did rate hikes to five points in like months. So, I mean, before that, definitely different. However, the reason I think the last 35 years matter is the way that we've been running the country, the data that the feds have been using to stabilize uh, inflation and interest rates has gotten much better. The likelihood of them. Like if they could go back and do it again in the 80s when we were having high inflation, really high interest rates, um, I think they would have handled it better because they had better data and better ways to tame it. Uh, now, knowing that, having one of the largest increases, we're kind of in new territory. Like we've never done this before. We're in uncharted waters, so to speak. And the impact of this, having high rates, having anything, by the way, my my sentiment still is you create a bubble anytime you do something faster than you've ever done it before. Whenever you throw us throw something with speed, you know, you, with large momentum, it's hard not to have that pendulum ball come back and smack it back a little bit. And so this idea that we could have a soft landing, that we could bring bring the economy plane down and actually land it and get inflation just to keep going sideways, I just don't know how you do that. I don't know how you have, don't have a bounce. And so my personal thoughts are, we're, we're at five points, by the way. And there's, once we cross five, there is a psychological shift that happens in the, the view of economists, the view of analysts, the view of consumers. And we're going to talk about that in a ne another chart. But the perception from a sentiment standpoint shifts. And we already have a ton of negative sentiment that we're going into a recession next year. And that's a recession based on inflationary or a recession based on GDP numbers, not adjusted GDP numbers after you uh, compensate for inflation. We would already be in a recession based on inflationary numbers. You guys have heard me talk about this before. When you take the growth of GDP over the last three years versus inflation over the last three years, we've had 17% increase in inflation over three years, guys, 17%. When GDP is less than that, you discount the inflation and we're actually negative. We're already in a recession had we had no inflation. So I, I don't see how things get better if interest rates go above 5%. And I just don't see how they're not. I think we're due for another 
uh, interest rate hike. Although this week we did have unemployment numbers tick up, which the feds are going to be looking at that and going, oh, okay, this is good news for us that we don't have to increase rates anymore, uh, which should help tame any future inflation as well. So we're going to have to see. This winter, I'd be watching uh, the data really close because it's going to set the tone for next year. So having said that, I want to show you guys this next chart. You're gonna, you guys are gonna love this. I dug this up, and frankly, this is probably one of the most revealing charts of the week. This is, and I have so much to say about this. This is 2024 projections. What's next for the U.S. economy? So this is like what, what's next for the U.S. next year? And a lot of people weighed in. And we also have the yield curve, which has nothing to do with people. It's just a uh, statistical um, a, a, it's a statistical evaluation of the bond market. I think it's the 30-year over the three or the 10-year. It's a 10-year it's a treasury over the three month is how they analyze this. But let me just go through this data really quick. So this is who thinks a recession is coming. And this was done by Bloomberg. Yep, Bloomberg Finance did the survey and compiled the data from the yield curve. And there's three categories. There's Wall Street, Main Street, and then C-suite. And the Wall Street section includes the feds, which the feds, they think there's a 0% chance, 0% chance that we're going to have a recession. Now, that's their job. Their job is to think and believe and to ensure the public that they have everything under control and that they know how to toggle interest rates and use a certain monetary policy to bring rates to, you know, basically back down to that two, 3% threshold uh, in terms of inflation so that we don't have recessions. I, that, I think that's insane. A 0% chance, I think it's insane. I think the cognitive bias of that staff is insane. Just how does no one think that it's not possible? Uh, I don't know. Yield curve. If you look at the yield curve, which is this, um, it's a statistical uh, 10-year minus three-month treasury yield, uh, that spread, it says it's at 61% likelihood. And if you, there's actually a chart that shows it and it shows it's been right every time. Like every time, I think at the last hundred years, when this uh, 10 year minus three month thing happens, you have a minor recession that happens after. It's just what happens. It's a reaction to uh, having to tame inflation typically. And so the yield curve has, a, it's just a number. It's not a, a bunch of people. Uh, it's weighed in at 61%. Economists are at about 50%. So they're about 48%. I've, I've got some opinions on why I think that number's that way. A lot of economists work for someone or they have a certain field or market that they typically folk or are hyper focused on. They're not general economists. Uh, for the most part, I would even say I have some cognitive biases sometimes, even though you could say, you know, I have a general economist background. Um, and that's why I think you're kind of 50 50. You've got a bunch of them who have kind of a motivation to have the market be bullish. And so, they kind of have this bias to say that where a lot of them are coming to reality and going, this is, just isn't going to work. Uh, so you're about 50-50. Consumers, which is interesting, are at 69%. So this was a surveyed poll where they went out and asked a bunch of consumers across the US, how likely do you think it will be we go into recession next year? And it was really high. Why? Is because I think they think I think they are already feeling it. Because of inflation and wages not keeping up with inflation, the amount your dollar can go to pay for your goods, cost of living, so on and so forth, uh, has gotten ridiculous. It's gotten really difficult. And I would say if you ask most consumers, they're saying it's harder than it was pre-pandemic. They're struggling more financially. We already know based on the numbers, national debt, guys, is at an all-time high, $1 trillion. It's approaching $1 trillion. And savings account, as we talked about two weeks ago, savings account went to an all-time low over like, uh, I think it was over a decade. So you combine the two, all-time high debt, savings accounts at all-time low, nothing, what can go wrong, right? So obviously the consumers are feeling it. And I think that's the sentiment you're seeing in this survey. Goldman Sachs, they say about 15%. We're going to talk a little bit about how and why Goldman Sachs and Bank of America have these opinions. Well, Goldman Sachs is a bank, but they're also an investor. 
And so they have a cognitive bias. They obviously prefer a bull market than a bear market. So I think that's kind of where that bias is coming in. Also, because their bank, and I'll say this about Bank of America also, they don't want to project fear into the market because as you're already seeing with bank stocks, bank stocks have not climbed because everyone's worried about these CREs or commercial loans that are going to have to renew next year. And they're going to have to renew at these all-time high rates. And a lot of projects, a lot of um, commercial buildings, commercial type uh, real estate is going to have to get renewed. And the people that own them, uh, which would be more of the CEO side on this, know what's actually going on where the banks don't know how solve. They're not going through these numbers. They're not going through to see like, you know, what's the occupancy, occupancy rate since we lend it. They don't do that. They don't ask current uh, lit, like their person that borrowed a couple million dollars. Hey, how are things going? They don't do that with their clients. They meet with a couple, but I think the banks have a cognitive bias. I think they're also bullish and trying to push their agenda. They also don't want to cause a bank run. The last thing Bank of America wants to say is, we think that's 80% likely recession. And everyone pulls their money out of Bank of America because they're going like, wow, what's going on? So I think you kind of have that sentiment going on with those two groups. Then you have CEOs at 84%. CEOs are saying 84% likelihood recession next year. So what is going on? Out of all these groups, who would know something better than maybe the, the rest? Who would have some like on the ground, uh, in the war zone feedback of like what's actually going on in the economy? And I would actually say it is CEOs. I coach CEOs. I've been a CEO. I quarterback some CEOs and other companies that we've helped start or uh, given revenue to. And frankly, there's no one that knows their business better, that knows the market better than CEOs. And here are some things to consider. The S&P 500 right now would not be positive without the big seven. In fact, it would be negative almost 1% last time I checked. And that might have changed. It might be worse now that the markets drove down a little. But the S&P 500 is literally being held up by seven stocks. And Tesla, even this last week, had bad earnings report. Elon uh, was caught on camera almost crying during his uh, investor report. He said it was very emotional. And it was seen as kind of negative sentiment as Tesla is having to drop their car prices and has seen a drop in revenue. Now, this is not going to be something that gets better into next year as we go into tightening uh, or some type of plausible recession. Now, CEOs, including Elon Musk, are looking at revenue and they're looking at their margins. And here's something to consider. A lot of companies, including companies that I am a part of, have gone through this whole inflationary period. And although cost of goods may have gone up, cost of services may have gone up, they have not adjusted their prices to go up because there's not enough demand. And so something that's actually happening in the market is we're seeing the same price of goods go out, but the costs went up due to inflation. And what does that do to margins? Well, it tightens them. Well, what happens when I have to refinance a loan? And now the margin that I had just completely goes upside down. Or what happens when uh, inflation continues or demand continues to drop? You know, all the stimulus money dries up and whatever product people were buying, they stop buying as much and that demand shrinks. And so the margin even gets tighter. Well, I think CEOs are seeing it. And I think this is a very strong case that there is something coming and CEOs are seeing something inside of their businesses that the rest, even consumers aren't seeing. And I'll, frankly, guys, when there's trouble in the hen, you know, in the, in the nest, so to speak, I don't go talking to the hens. And that is how most CEOs are. Most CEOs instill confidence with their employees, with the people that they work with. So it, it makes a lot of sense that unless you're high level executive, you likely probably don't even know how well your company's doing because frankly, leadership doesn't want to project weakness. Okay. All right. So other things that I thought was interesting, there's at the bottom of this chart, you guys see this sliver. It says the percentage of S&P 500 companies citing keywords. And I thought these words were interesting 
because these companies, as they write articles or they put stuff out, this was like some really cl clever data that came in that showed words that are being used either more frequently or less frequently. And one of the words that's being used less frequently going into 2023 compared to last year is inflation. We're seeing a significant drop in the word inflation used by S&P 500 companies, which makes sense because inflation is taming. And so it's not that big of a topic anymore. Material costs is also dropping because with inflation, we're seeing less of it, but there's, it's still being talked about, which is scary. The fact that we have inflation pretty much tamed and we're still talking about it at 68% and material costs, we're still talking at it at 37%. That's still not great to have pretty much tamed inflation. We're still talking about it with a, a varying lagging degree from last year is not great. Economic slowdown has dropped significant by these S&P 500 companies. That makes a lot of sense. And then job cuts is something that has gone up this year. So end of last quarter, beginning this year, we saw that massive spike. If you guys remember the big, the reason, by the way, I think you saw a lot of words was the big seven. Those seven top companies were the ones laying off early this year. The other companies are, you know, these other CEOs who don't have uh, all these analysts and all these economists and people giving them advice are a little slower to react. And so I think you're seeing that layoff uh, happening later in the quarters. But you can see that the little bars there, it's staying pretty significant, high, significantly high. And we'll probably see something like this going into Q4, Q1 again into this year. So I would actually imagine that these percentages will go up. But anyways, interesting data. So uh, bear case data is showing that, you know, there's clearly, uh, a lot of pessimism in the market from consumers, the yield curve and CEOs, but the bull case is GDP is up and GDP growth was up over 3%, uh, from the last quarter. And so there is this kind of, which isn't bad news. It's good news, but there is this kind of like negative, uh, what would I call this? Almost like a negative, like a psych. You know, when you're playing basketball and you're trying to make a move to the right and you, you know, you kind of psych someone out to the left. I I would be very cautious with the optimism that you have around this single quarter growth in GDP because there's a lot of negative news behind it. That's all I'd say. All right, what else we got? Oh, so we, I got to get into this. So we got to move a little quicker. There was some news that came in around Bitcoin, and I have to show you guys this tweet. Uh, maybe should I do the article first? No, let's do the tweet first. So for those of you who are watching the crypto market, there has been significant movement with Bitcoin, but I want to share with you why so that you don't get over optimistic. You don't start throwing a ton of money in the crypto industry without kind of knowing what's going on. But there was this thread that went out, Cointelegraph literally put out a news. Look at the very bottom of this. Cointelegraph on uh, X, formerly known Twitter, sent out a message saying, breaking, SEC approves iShares Bitcoin spot ETF. That was the headline. SEC approves iShares Bitcoin spot ETF. In the midst of all these ETFs getting rejected, uh, there was a, a court of appeal or some type of appeal that happened uh, with one of the ETFs that now the SEC has to look at again. But in reality, there was no SEC approval. And you can see James uh, uh, Seferit came out with a tweet and was like, hey, and by the way, this tweet got deleted. But he went out and said, hey, like, I'm not seeing anywhere that this happened, we can't confirm or you know deny this, but I'm not seeing that we can confirm this in any way. And then other people in this tweet thread started chatting in and uh, they're like, nope, there was nothing from the SEC. No, there was nothing from uh, I or from uh, iShares. This is complete bogus, but let me show you what happened in the market, even though that was fake news. So Bitcoin, let's see if I can get into this. Here we are. Bitcoin, here's a four-hour chart. This, this is kind of revealing. This shows you the climb that happened. Here's our daily chart on the right. We really just need two charts, but you can kind of see what happened. We went literally from 
30,000 to 34,000 off of fake news. And a lot of people are saying, well, then shouldn't this come back down in price? And generally speaking, I would say yes. And often the slingshot makes it worse than better. However, there's something unique going on that maybe this announcement shed a light on where there was a, I think there's a large portion of the community that is not aware of what's going on with the Bitcoin ETF. And to show you, just to kind of bring this into light, here's an article on, I think what has happened, why the price has stabilized and stay, is currently staying at 34. So this fake news came out, but I think a lot of participants and non-participants in the crypto market had no idea about all of these ETFs that have been filed. And what happened is Grayscale filed an ETF. They were one of the first to file an ETF uh, with the SEC. And what basically an ETF is a way to get the public to uh, invest in a specific asset class in a conglomerate fund, right? Where right now you can't do. You can, they're like Grayscale, BlackRock. They can't take their traders' money or their uh, people who've invested money with them, they can't take their money and put it into Bitcoin right now because there's no vehicle to do it in. And an ETF would be the answer for that. And so what they're doing is essentially creating additional market cap that would go into the market, which would potentially drive the price up. And so the way this works, market cap increase equals bull, market cap decrease equals bear. So if the market cap or total amount of dollars in an asset, in this case, Bitcoin, the market cap goes up, the price will go up. And so if there are more participants and more money that goes in by having a new vehicle like an ETF, you know, Grayscale, they've got billions of dollars, BlackRock, billions of dollars. If the players say, oh, you know, maybe I'll put 1% of my fund into Bitcoin, that's going to create additional market cap and that move alone will bring the price up. It, it just has to. And that's what people are starting to realize is the SEC is kind of in a corner right now. Uh, Gensler this week said he won't say what he's going to do in terms of the grayscale loss. But what happened is grayscale filed for an ETF. They lost. SEC said, nope. And they put out this bogus reason why. And then what happened is in the appeals process, they lost. And they said, no, you have to reevaluate this SEC. You need to go back and do this. So now the SEC not only has all these other ETFs that they either need to approve or deny, but the one they are denied, they have to look at again. And so there's a lot of pressure for the SEC to say yes to one eventually. And then once one does, we imagine the dominoes will fall and that will increase the market cap. And so I think a lot of people are going, oh, well, I put my money in or I made a play based on this you know, fake news. But what I'm realizing is that was probably a good idea because if an ETF or when an ETF happens, it's probably going to blow up towards the upside, uh, the market cap. And so just to put this in your space, you want to be watching if you like Bitcoin, if you're bullish towards Bitcoin, you want to get into Bitcoin, you want to make some money towards the bull side of Bitcoin, market cap increase is what to look for. And the, the topic to be watching every day is an ETF approval. Now, if you want to get in before that, the risk is it goes down before that, right? The risk is that something happens fundamentally, the price drops uh, before the ETF files, and then you know you lose a bunch of money before, and then the ETF comes out and it goes back up. That can happen. So you could position in now, or you could wait until it happens. And frankly, once the approval happens, then more cash will come in after. And so you're kind of betting on the cash that will come in after people start allocating money into the ETF. All right. So that is kind of a lesson 101 on the markets, how the markets work. But I mean, that's valuable information to understand because then you can start to play the fundamentals like the pros. And you better believe when that ETF gets approved, there is going to be insane volume uh, in the market. All right. What do we got next? Let me just review this really quick and see where we're at. Oh, jobless claims. I do. I think I brought that up on the chart. Let me just pull it up really quick since we've got nine minutes and then we'll do our last trade. I do want to mention jobless claims. 
because as you know, it's one of my key KPIs or performance. Yeah, we'll call it a KPI. It's a it's a performance indicator that I'm watching because I believe the house of cards that like everything's standing on right now, the one that's the most fragile is jobless claims. It's uh, unemployment numbers. And we saw this recent number come through and I just want to show this to you guys. But jobless claims did tick up and it was worse than expected. So you can see here is previous, here's current at uh, 210,000. And if you go to our, uh, in our, in green charts, um, economic calendar, you can see right here, initial jobless claims. They expected it to be at 208 and it came in higher than expected. So. Previously, we we're at 198, which was really good. We've gone, they thought it was going to get worse. It did, but it was worse than they expected, which is bad news. The market reacted to that. And that's why we've seen the drop in the S&P 500 and a continue uh, bearish market on the S&P 500, which uh, I think is a good transition. Well, let's bring over, let's go into our S&P 500 chart. So we set up our trade on gold already. I think it, it would be wise of us to look at the S&P 500. We've got to make some adjustments to this, but you can see kind of where we set things up last week. We drew in this channel and gosh, we just, you can't do a better job of this guys. Start doing this to your friends and they're going to think you've got like a crystal ball or something, but you can see here's our channel. We predicted based on the channel and how tight it was that it would likely hit this support 4,200 and bounce which it did Monday, Tuesday, it bounced, went into this price range. Then we got some really negative news, right? Started getting jobless claims and all this other negative news about the market and started dropping out. And it was so bad, it broke the 4,200 level. And it tried getting back into this channel. It really likes how steep this is right now. And that's fine. Uh, we're going to have to make some adjustments on this. But um, if you'd taken a trade towards the bounce Monday, Tuesday, you would have made great money. We talked about if it broke the 4,200 level, you would be in the money on this also. So we were right on both of these predictions and trades. Uh, I don't know how we can set this up any better, but let's see if we can nail it again today. So I'm going to delete some of the tools on here. We nailed these last week. We'll mark this as today. And we need to draw in a new channel to the short side because it's kind of blown out. Break this up a little bit better. Yeah, that's good. So here's our new channel, and it's very likely to follow inside of this going in. Let's look at how far down our support is. So right now I'm looking at the S&P 500, and one of the things I'm concerned about is we oh let's look at this channel too so this channel has changed we can bring this channel down also to there but we're in definitely a bearish channel all the way back to august of last year so pre-september we are in a downward trend on the s p 500 and then we're in this really really steep downward trend that's happened over the last two weeks and currently we're not center, we're kind of at the bottom of the channel. We're at the very bottom of this longer channel and we have support at 4,100. And currently we're at 4,147. So we've only got like 50 points uh, before it hits that support. So what's the likelihood? Well, it's likely to stay within this region, Monday, Tuesday. So it's very likely, let's just kind of draw what's gonna happen here. It's very likely that we're going to want to stay. Oh, it's going to be, need to be a little smaller. It's going to want to stay here. And the reason is, is if we extend this, which I'm going to do. I'm going to bring this up a little bit more, guys. All right. I just want to zoom in so you guys can see this better. But it's very likely, and I'm going to delete this line. 
because that's today. I'll put it back in when we're done. But the likelihood of this being here is very high. And this would be like Monday, probably Tuesday, unless we have a lot of volume. The reason is it will keep us in this short channel on Monday. The candle's going to open somewhere over here, uh, close to the 4,100 range, and then 4,143. And then uh, it's likely going to hit this support and bounce up. And so Monday, you're going to see kind of a candle. My prediction would be it's going to want to stay in this price unless we get, this is a technical analysis, unless we get some wild fundamental news. And that's when you see things uh, get a little wonky out of the technicals. How do you trade this? Well, you're going to look for a potential trade to the upside. So breakout up here, make this nice and small. You're going to look for a breakout that comes into this region, or you're going to look for a breakout which is more powerful and going to have more velocity and potential profit and lower risk, I would also say, to the downside. And that's going to be here. Make this nice and small. It's going to be this range here. And I'm going to put that within that channel. So you really have a breakout below the 4,100 level, the support, or a breakout out of the channel into this region. And this, you know, we could kind of, expand this also because really it could go into a couple days but if you have this break of the channel it's likely going to come up and then it the next place it's going to te test is 4200 because you're going against the trend two trends by the way you got to keep that stop loss really tight so a really tight stop uh towards the upside definitely keep your targets below the 4200 level that should be safe if you get a breakout but keep your, your stops tight, guys, because you just can't afford to move. move. Uh, you can't afford to lose much in a opposite trend trade. Now, I like the downside trend. This one, if it breaks 4,100, stays in the channel, uh, you could put that stop, especially it's going to be a double resistance because now you're out of the channel and the support has now become resistance at 4,100. You could take this thing down all the way to the next support level which is, let me get the price, 4056. And, you know, obviously you don't want to take it all the way. So you maybe take it to half. If it breaks it again, this channel will continue and then you could get another trade below. So it is possible, depending on how fast this moves. Let's see, this would be Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Now it's not going to happen. It could be Friday. Maybe you get a breakout below this, but I'm not going to draw it in. Keep your this this one I like if it goes to the short side because again you can keep your stop really close. You can let your profit go, and then I'm going to give you a second option on the trade. Once you get profitable towards you know halfway through this, uh, you can actually put a a uh, stop order in to keep your profits in, like half your profits locked in, but allow it to keep running. And when you are in a double trend like this, I like to do that. Let your profits. This is one of those examples of how to let your profits run and cut your losses short. And this is a perfect example of where you've got double technicals telling you sell, sell on uh, the S&P 500. And um, you combine this with some fundamental news and it's going to be a win. So if you get a breakout, you can lock in some profits on this. I think it's worth letting the trade run through the next support level if it will allow it. And then if it does that, you'll move and lock in your profits at the 40, 56 level or just above that. Because at that point, it may come down below four, five, six, but then it'll hit it. It'll be support becomes resistance. And that new stop loss that you put in has locked in a uh, significant amount of profit. So that's that's how I would do it. Again, guys, this is my opinion. You guys know all the, the risk disclaimers. Do your own homework. Uh, but we'll see. Next Friday, we'll see how this goes. I'm going to draw on my line. But there is our S&P 500 trade. All right. So I think that pretty much wraps up our session today. Let me just check and make sure there wasn't anything else I wanted to say. Yep, that wraps it up for today, guys. Thanks for being on. Um, obviously, I'm going I'm to share something I heard from someone else today to kind of end this. Um, the confident in, in markets like this, the confident and the shy are the ones that lose. 
The skeptical are the ones who survive. And so this is not a time to be complacent. This is not a time to be confident. This is a time to be very skeptical in all of your investments and everything that you do financially, because we are in a time of what I would call high uncertainty with way too much confidence. And if you're looking at the major investors, guys like Warren Buffett, uh, people like Charlie Munger, they are playing the sidelines pretty heavily right now. They are hedging their bets in things like gold and in bonds and in safe debt. Uh, they are not all in. In fact, some of them have even taken a very strong cash position this year. And so be highly skeptical right now if you want to survive. Do not get too overconfident that the market's going to crash. Don't get too overconfident the market's going to take off. But also don't be shy. Don't be like, oh, we'll just leave it all in there and see what happens. Be highly skeptical. Start diversifying now. And then when things start to climb back, you can get in. When You got to remember, when things crash, they crash fast. When they climb, they climb pretty slow. And so I think you could get back into the climbs without missing a whole lot and being shy and diversified. So there you go, guys. Thanks for being on here. We'll see you same time, same place next week. I will be getting our real estate data before that, but we won't actually announce it and go through it until the second Friday. But I will give you some tips on kind of what the data is saying. So we'll see you next uh, week and stay safe, uh, Market Pulse, the Market Pulse members. Thanks, guys. We'll see you. Oh,